Hello, everyone. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Ria Venkatesh, and I'm one of the graduates from the batch of 2020. The reason I'm here today is because my thesis project is something that I'm hoping could provide a little guidance or clarity to help you go about your design project. So having spent the better part of 2020 working on a school project or, or a Willet school project to be precise, uh, I can say that it has boundless scope for creativity, innovation, and massive scope for the imagination. Uh, so I, for one, can tell you that this is a wonderful topic to work on. OK, uh, in my opinion, when you're designing for the future leaders of tomorrow who are supposed to grow exponentially for the benefit of society, your inspiration must not end at just being assigned the project, but also choosing it and finding your own reasons to accept it and making it your own. So for instance, uh, I will be sharing you a small video to take you through the reasons that inspired me to design my thesis project, The Third Teacher, an alternative school in Vivian community. OK, uh, so um, uh, so in my opinion, when you're designing for the future leaders of tomorrow who are supposed to grow exponentially for the benefit of society, your inspiration must not end at just being assigned the project, but also choosing it and finding your own reasons to accept it and making it your own. So for instance, I'm going to just show you a small video uh, to take you through the reasons that inspired me to design my thesis project, The Third Teacher, an alternative school and weaving community.
Uh, okay, so uh, these are just a few of the clips and the experiences that I had when I decided to stay uh, for a couple of days living with the people, understanding their local language, their activities, etc. So uh, I would suggest that your first step at approaching this project should be finding a personal reason or a connect that inspires you to start designing the school. Uh, and no, Sandeep says deadlines do not count as a reason. Uh, okay, so now that we have this out of the way, we can get into the process of design. So everyone here right now would have their own approach to the project at hand, but let me give you an insight on what worked best for me. Okay, so this was the process that I followed to give me uh, direction in completing the project. Firstly, uh, is the background study. So certain topics you could cover while you're doing your background study would include uh, student demographics, like the number of girls and boys in the village, information about the various other schools that are there in the village, uh, age groups of children, as well as different types of schools, like if it's a private school, government, uh, public owned, etc. Uh, so what I did was I spent three days in the village where I conducted my background study by interacting with the locals and learning about the habits, lifestyles and the day to day activities. I spent a considerable amount of time with the children of the village uh, where I tried to understand what their expectations of the space might be. Uh, I also conducted different surveys for the village elders, the weavers and the students, which uh, helped me receive more clarity to continue my process. Uh, the second one is the research. So while I started my research, I tried uh, to think not only in the architectural plane, but also look at it from the point of view of the teachers and administrators who will be running the school and how my design fulfills to their requirements as well. So I researched multiple theories and ideologies by famous philosophers. Uh, one, for example, is Rudolf Steiner. Uh, so this gave me a better understanding of how to design uh, an optimum learning environment. So my research also comprised of findings from shows and movies that de uh, depict references to certain ideologies that made me further my research and topics. Uh, for example, one day uh, I was just like watching the Simpsons episode and I came across this one episode where um, the school uh, decides, uh, the Springfield Elementary School decides to turn into a Waldorf school. Uh, and so I tried to research on what Waldorf school is and how it's beneficial. And so these were sort of inspirations and also helped my research process. OK, next is the case studies. Uh, so the reason like I chose case studies after background studies and uh, research is so that I can pick case studies that relate to my requirements. For example, I didn't choose case studies of like the top 10 schools of uh, India or like the top 10 schools of the world. Uh, I didn't try to take their ideologies and put it into my design, but rather I chose case studies that are effective and efficient to village schools. Uh, so both the positive and negative student experiences from these schools also played a very important part in my design process. So next comes the site analysis, um, uh, which I will discuss upon further later. OK, uh, now is the functional diagram. Um, just designing a school uh, which is a good looking structure is not enough. Your design must be conducive with all the activities happening in the school. Um, uh, usage and division of the areas and spaces along with like the different curriculum and uh, various uh, area requirements etc are proper for the planning of the school. Uh, so this is basically the last step or the final step of the process where all the steps are put together to create the final end result. So while I was designing, uh, I didn't have a sort of a preconceived style or a particular aesthetic that I wanted. Instead, I tried to understand what was the greatest concern, what was the biggest problem, what are the greatest potentials, and I tried to turn all those factors into drivers for my design decisions. Um, this is done so that like uh, each decision is informed with a specific piece of information. Like I'm not designing an air. Everything that I design has a particular reason or a history or a purpose behind it. Um, and this information is what we get through all the five other processes that we have just spoken about. Okay. 
so now coming to the site analysis and zoning. Um, once I finished my site study, uh, so uh, I made sure I spent my uh, time in the site like for three, uh, like in the morning, afternoon and the night. So I would see how the site behaves at different times. Uh, I've also visited the site long ago when it was in the rainy season and the summer season. So I kind of have a connect to the site. So I know exactly what I'm designing for. <clears throat> Uh, so once I finished my site study, the first thing that I did was uh, I divided my site into various zones. These zones were divided depending on various factors, like which areas are more private, which areas have better enclosure, which provides the best views, vegetation, etc. Then after I divided the site into various zones, what I did was uh, I placed various activities from my requirements into these zones. Like, for example, a playground can be in a place where it doesn't have to be that private. It can be in like an open space, uh, etc. So this kind of helped me uh, form my zoning, form the basic zoning. Uh, so the diagram that you see on the left uh, is something that helped me majorly in forming the basis of my initial zoning. OK, so uh, what I did next was uh, I converted my zoning into an actual scale zoning. So with the actual sizes uh, and getting the actual heights of the building, which uh, would help me further on into my site planning. Uh, this was done so I get like a realistic image of how, how what the scale is and what the massing is like. So uh, now I will be taking you through my design uh, and I will be starting with the site plan. <clears throat> okay. So the entry of the site is primarily by three ways. You have the pedestrian entry, you have the vehicular entry, and also there exists a third entry, which is directly for the weavers of the village, which leads directly into the weavers block. Upon entering the pedestrian entry, you see that there is a large plaza from where a person can choose four different directions to go towards. So the first one is uh, leads to the admin block. The second one leads to the weavers hub. The third one leads to the kindergarten block. And the fourth one leads to the cycling or the skating rink. So standing in the pedestrian entry, you can see that towards the left, there is an agricultural field. And towards the right, there is a pathway that is surrounded by trees that leads to the kindergarten block. OK, uh, so standing in the plaza, you can see the largest structure that is designed on site. This stu structure is placed on the highest contour, and this is the high school and the middle school block. So behind the site, uh, you can see that there are a number of boulders which are present on hillocks, which gives it a scenic background to my site. So the admin is placed closest to the entry in such a way that the principal can have a look as to who enters the site and who exits the site. Also, the principal has a direct view to the kindergarten block, which uh, is something that uh, requires constant attention towards. Um, so there is a patch of land right next to the admin block, which is an agricultural land which is utilized by children to learn plantation, harvesting, agriculture, because in villages, uh, most of uh, the family's uh, main trade would be agriculture. So uh, my idea was to bring in the learning of that in the schools as well. So you're just not learning subjects like uh, science or, uh, you know, social and stuff like that. You're learning what you might require in the future as well. OK, uh, so behind the admin, you can see this mini plaza where there is a bird bath. So uh, the village of Anegundi is very known for the various birds that are uh, indigenous to that place. So uh, a way of attracting birds towards the site, uh, I have provided a bird bath right behind the admin block. So from the admin plaza, if you walk towards the left, you will reach the weavers hub. The weavers hub is situated uh, amidst the coconut plantations, providing solitude and a serene environment to work in. The weavers hub consists of a small pathway that leads to the library and the cafeteria block. So what makes this cafeteria special is the fact that the food for the users of the school are prepared uh, and the ingredients and the resources are grown on the site. So if you can see right behind the cafeteria block is a large uh, piece of land that is suitable for growing 
uh, organic fruits, uh, vegetables, etc., which is in turn used as uh, preparation for the food. Also, in front of the cafeteria block, you can see a cow shed and a chicken coop, where the milk and the eggs are also used as ingredients in the food items. So right outside this library, you can see a red oxide conversation pit. This red oxide pit is open to sky so that uh, you know you can take your learning outside. You have your library and cafeteria right here. And you, know, you don't want to be in an enclosed area. You want to just sit right below the sky. So here is a red oxide uh, conversation pit. Uh, the pit is situated in a T-shaped plaza. So this plaza connects the library to the faculty block and the common areas. Um, it also connects uh, the faculty block to the high school and the middle school blocks. So from the labs and the common area, there happens to be a linear vision right into the library. Okay, uh, so the junction of the common areas forms a pathway leading to this huge bridge, which takes you up to the high school and the middle school block. The bridge rests on a series of bamboo columns extending from one end to the other, where you get views of the entire site below it. Because it's on the highest contour level, uh, you're able to see every part of the site from this bridge. So behind the bridge is another interesting feature I found from my case study, which is the solar field. So this solar field generates electricity to the entire site. Uh, towards the right, you can see the primary block. This block is surrounded by an orchard on one side, having flowering trees and fruit trees, making the entire grades of one to four an, an extremely colorful place to uh, study in. So uh, the primary block is connected to the plaza. So this plaza consists of uh, a central um, node, which can have uh, installations that are done by the weavers or done by the students itself. So this major plaza connects to uh, all the major spaces. First, it connects to the faculty blocks and the labs. It connects to the high school and the middle school block. It uh, connects to the uh, primary block. It connects to the kindergarten, the admin, and also to the football fields and the running track. OK, so uh, if upon entering the site, you decide to go right instead of taking a left, you reach the kindergarten block. Uh, so the kindergarten block is designed in such a way that there are three different playgrounds. This is done uh, because once you finish your first year in school and uh, you move to the next year, the playgrounds also change along with you, depending on your age group and the growth level and the type of play required for uh, each grade. So the first playground consists of a mud pit. Uh, so it has a small miniature park equipment and uh, a lot of equipment in the mud. Uh, so the second playground consists of a fort uh, where the students can climb above and view the surrounding buildings around them. And then uh, there also exists a circular um, blackboard material so children can draw on the floor where they can express themselves and the entire floor becomes a canvas for free expression. So this is the last playground that consists of a petting zoo, where children can learn how to rear uh, domestic animals. And this helps build compassion in children at a very young age. Another interesting feature of the kindergarten block is the compost toilet. Here, uh, the concept of a dry toilet using mud instead of wasting water is a practice that uh, I want uh, the schools to follow. OK, uh, so if a student is coming to school by uh, a cycle, uh, he or she is made to uh, go towards the right where there is a cycle stand and also a cycle and skating rink right next to it. Uh, the entry of the buses uh, are through this vehicular entry where there is parking available for a number of buses and autos as well. During programs and events, the amphitheater is used for celebration and so it is placed closest to the parking and the entry. Uh, this entire site has two playgrounds. One is a large public playground that is open at all times to all the uh, residents of Anigundi. And then there is a private playground that is open only uh, for the children who are going to the school. OK, so. Um, there was another feature that I uh, like to do in any site plan, and that is called the in-between spaces. So um, I have divided the different spaces based on green spaces, sustainable inserts, uh, farm animal related spaces, interesting spaces, and views. So the uh, 
the first one i'll be talking about is the views so these are the various views that the site gets uh, each part of the site gets a different view and uh, i've done it in such a way that throughout the experience of 10 years in that school you wouldn't be seeing the same view at all the times at uh, every year that you pass by you get to see a different view of the site uh, and also having boulders around the site uh, helped create better viewpoints and better vantage points for uh, better learning so uh, the next one is sustainable inserts. So the three sustainable inserts, uh, major sustainable inserts I've done is the solar field, uh, and it is placed in the southwest direction for maximum sunlight. The next one is the compost toilets where uh, they are not wasting any water. And then you have uh, rammed earth structures where I've made sure that all my structures are made out of rammed earth, um, used bamboos, cobs, earth bricks, etc. Uh, so the next one is the farm animal related uh, spaces. So here I have a bird bath to attract birds into the site. Here I have a petting zoo uh, to rare animals and children can learn by observation. They can learn about animals rather than seeing it in the textbooks, uh, but they can learn it while uh, you know, st uh, studying and being around them. Uh, next one is the goshala, where there is a cow shed and a chicken coop, where uh, you use uh, uh, the milk, etc., for uh, cooking. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so these are the uh, farm animal related spaces. And then coming to the green spaces. So uh, I have the orchard where there are a lot of flowering trees and fruit trees uh, for children to, uh, you know, go out. They can probably read books under there. They can pick flowers. They can pick fruits. They, they can know how plantation happens, etc. cetera. Uh, so there are uh, lands for grazing because Anegundi is known to have a lot of cows just uh, running around in the streets. So, uh, you you know, uh, the cows are allowed to come into the school. Uh, there's, it's not going to be a walled up school. It's going to be a completely immersed school. So uh, there is an existing coconut plantation on the site where children can learn how to climb coconut trees as an occupation as well. Um, and then there's an agricultural field. This is a part of land which is suitable for agricultural um, uh, cultivation. So here they can have hands-on learning as to how cultivation happens. Uh, and then there's an organic garden to grow fruits and vegetables. So the last is uh, interesting spaces. So I've tried to create uh, spaces that makes people get uh, intrigued they want to know about it more so i have a huge bridge at the highest contour uh, i have a, a lot of different playgrounds it's not like one single playground that um, you know you just have uh, one set of things for the for the uh, five years of your life that you're here so uh, i have a cycle ring because uh, people in anegundi they they extremely love cycling they're very dangerous people they like cliff jumping into the tungabhadra river so uh, you know having those spaces in the school might make them want to come to the space well give give them memories of the space Okay, so I will uh, start explaining my first block, which happens to be the admin block. So uh, the first view to the admin block, it gives you an illusion that the entire building is floating or hovering over water. So this block is surrounded by water on all sides, making it appear to be light in weight. So um, the entry into the admin block is through a series of long steps. So here you can see that uh, there are, this is the entry into the admin block where there are steps going downwards. And uh, once you go downwards, you reach this courtyard space. So this is the courtyard space that you reach. This courtyard space acts as the waiting lobby. Instead of having an, uh, you know, enclosed space uh, for parents to wait. So you have a semi open courtyard area uh, for which acts as a waiting area for the admin block. So towards the left, you can see the reception. The reception has a direct view into the um, waiting lobby. Behind the reception, you have like the required offices, the bursary, the back office, the record room, etc. So the principal's office uh, was something that required a lot of transparency. So it required views of major parts of the site. So I've designed the print. I've designed the principal's uh, office in such a way that you get views to the kindergarten block and you get views of uh, the entry of the site as to you can see who enters the site and who leaves the uh, school. Um, yeah, so 
the chairman and the director's room so it kind of has a tunnel vision that uh, views to the agricultural land behind so when a person is walking down the stairs they can see a gap between the two buildings which shows them parts of the agricultural field which kind of intrigues or interests them to go and see what is exactly happening over there okay so this is a section that's cut towards the entry into the courtyard block towards this entry so uh, you can see the courtyard you can see the reception desk where they can look right into the waiting lobby and call uh, the parents who have to go and speak to uh, the required people uh, and this is the section showing the office. This is the principal's uh, room where uh, this is this is the moat in front where you can have like a uh, fish or turtles making the space an interesting space. Uh, this is the moat around the entire admin block. Uh, so this is the main section that is cut through the courtyard in this direction uh, where you can see the entry into the courtyard and you can see the principal's block and the other offices with the record rooms, etc. and the moat on the sides. Okay, so um, th these are a few of the renders that um, show the water area, how the steps go downwards, and the rammed earth material that is used for the admin block. Okay. So now coming to the primary block. So the primary block includes the grades of first grade to fourth grade with two sections each. Waldorf education stretch, stresses on the principle of color and how color affects the growth of the child. And here I've tried to incorporate all the principles that help the growth of the child during this stage. So uh, various activities of the children at this age include uh, reciting poems, fairy tales, myths, rhymes, uh, music, etc. So they require imaginative and creative classrooms that provide major scope for the imagination. Uh, so a child can imagine that he is in Neverland like Peter Pan or she is in a Wonderland like Alice. They also require a space that keeps their creative juices flowing. So for example, by sowing seeds, building huts, picking fruits, knitting, painting, working with clay, reading, reciting, writing, etc. So, uh, you, you know, uh, at this age, it, you're not really focused on just textbook learning. Um, it's going to be something that's so monotonous. And Waldorf education is something that uh, provides hands-on learning where people learn by doing stuff. So um, I've tried to design the space in such a way that I'm able to incorporate all the various activities that a children, that a ch uh, child, that will help a child grow technically. Okay, so when I picture this block, I see children are out digging in the fields. I see them sewing, I see them reading under the trees, chopping, cooking, etc. all the while learning while doing. So once you enter into the main gate of the primary block, you will see that the floor is filled with colored tiles. Waldorf Education says that exposing children to colors of red and orange are very vital at this stage. Uh, so this block consists of uh, different modules that are made out of rammed earth and they are repeated twice to form this uh, one entire module. Okay, uh, so the first grade and the uh, second grade, uh, both these grades have a staircase that leads to the play pen or the play fort. So this is the staircase that leads to the upstairs part of the classroom. The classroom is of two levels. Um, this leads to the uh, part of play. And this is the staircase taking them up, up here. If you can see it in this isometric, this is the play fort. So an interesting thing about this fort is that you can talk to the children of the other classrooms as well. You can have interaction with children in the other classroom as well. So basically the idea I had for this block were twofold. Uh, the first one is the furniture of the blocks should all be inbuilt. Like if there are cupboards, the cupboards have to be inbuilt into the wall so that children have more room for play. So you don't have, uh, you know, your cupboards blocking the way you have an entire, um, you know, uh, like an uh, arena uh, for, um, play and the second one is uh, circle time so circle time is an important feature in world of education where students are made to uh, share various events of the day making these children more uh, confident giving them a capacity to talk about the day so having uh, furnitures that are inbuilt will give large areas for uh, them to sit around and talk to each other 
not uh, restricting them into the uh, rows of chairs and uh, tables with the teacher's desk in front. OK, coming to the interesting features of this site. So I provided two types of doors to enter every classroom. So um, there is a one large sized human door which is designed for the adults and the other is a miniature door that only is able to fit kids, making this an element that they can own, something that they can perceive. Um, so there is also a small red oxide pit for a private play experience. Uh, basically, why I have all these different spaces is because I kept this one thing in my mind that not all children are the same, that each child is different and each child prefers an environment that is different from the other. Um, maybe one person might like a, a complete open space where they can interact with everyone, they can play around, but some students might be uh, who, who like quiet places, who uh, like to just read and sit and talk to a few people. So I, I wanted to give everyone a place where they belong. They shouldn't feel like uh, they are left out um, of the design. So um, yes. OK, uh, the entire kindergarten itself forms an ecosystem of its own, creating a place for building stories. My hope was that when people walk into this building, they get to know a little bit about the type of people who belong here. Now, suppose uh, we were to walk into the school and you know we see few children uh, in their own nooks and corners of the school. We kind of understand what type of a child that person is as well. Um, my hope was that, uh, yeah, the, so towards the end of the plus shape, so this basically forms a plus shape courtyard, and towards the end, you can see a toilet, which is uh, designed to be age appropriate. This toilet consists of a water body on both sides uh, with fish and turtle for um, the children to look after. So here uh, you can see the water bodies on all the sides where each classroom has to take care uh, of their own um, like turtles or fish or, or uh, any of uh, those kind of uh, something to build their compassion. Um, OK, another important feature of this block is the door that leads to the orchard. The orchard is filled with a bunch of flowering trees and plants where children can go apple picking, uh, fruit picking, uh, et cetera. So there is a small red door that leads you into the orchard. The concept came from one of my favorite movies as a kid, and uh, that is technically Narnia, where there is a whole world that exists uh, that exists within that small door. So when you come in, you don't really know what's happening. But once you open the door, you have like this entire huge uh, orchard behind it. OK, so. Coming to the sections, uh, the sections of the primary block are designed to promote maximum level of play and exploration. Uh, I basically provided depressions in the wall. I provided holes in the walls. Uh, there are holes over the water bodies. There is a fort bridge. There are uh, rock climbing walls. Uh, there is skylight bringing light beams, etc. Um, so this is a section that shows the hole in the wall that acts as a portal towards the orchard. So a small red door like Nanya is the scale of a child. One wall of the classroom has a huge giant abacus that is inbuilt into the wall. So uh, a learning element becomes part of the architectural element itself. Um, so there are skylights that provide light beams into the inside. And there is an other depression here in the wall where children can sit right above the water um, area. And it's like they're sitting higher than everyone else. Also, there is a red oxide pit at a lower level than the rest of the classroom, which consists of small windows for kids to look out of. And they can peep into the orchard. And they also have a shelf for storing books, which creates a calm environment for people to read. On special days, this place can become a multi-purpose space where they can fill it up with water, or they can uh, use it as a pool, and they can uh, you know, create a ball pit, etc. It's a kind of a versatile, uh, flexible space. Um, another interesting feature are the doors. So I've made the doors in such a way that they behave as blackboard canvases. So uh, you don't have to limit your drawings to just the books. You can draw on the doors. You can uh, you know, just express yourselves in, through the classrooms itself, through architecture. 
Um, the next one is a rock climbing wall. So for adventurous kids who are extremely daredevil kids, uh, you, you have places where, uh, you know, you can like climb up and you can create your own adventures through the place. Um, and also there are forts where children can interact with students of other classrooms. Also from here, you get a good view of the orchard that is uh, placed right behind. Um, the floors and the walls of the roofs uh, are designed with all kinds of activities like you have rock climbing walls, you have sketchboards, hole in the walls, tunnels, etc. This provides major scope for the imagination as opposed to a boring plain four walled classroom. Every block has a whole world inside it. Okay, so coming to the faculty block, uh, the faculty block was designed keeping in mind that the teachers are not only a part of a school community, but they are a community within themselves. They spend most of their time in the room. Maybe they spend it after hours, sometimes on weekends and holidays. And it is imperative to give them a feeling of wanting to stay. They shouldn't feel like, you know, traumatized or uh, like, tired of staying in the same place uh, all the time. So I wanted to give importance to everyone residing in this school. So I tried to achieve this phenomenon by using light, vegetation, levels, openness, etc., making the space as interactive as possible. Okay, the entry into this faculty block is through this conversation pit. And as you walk through the foldable doors, you will see that the entire block is a separate ecosystem by itself. So you have a huge central water body, uh, which has a series of staircase on it, which leads to the mezzanine floor above it. When you walk right inside, you don't see a blank and a boring wall on the opposite, but you, opposite side, but you see large um, long windows that allow you to view the garden on the outside. Okay, so there is a lobby space towards the left. So this lobby space is surrounded by uh, a green space around it, which doesn't give you a feeling of being enclosed or captivated. It gives you a freeing experience. So whenever the faculty decides to take a break or sit outside and talk to each other, they can use this lobby space where uh, I have provided a space with like a coffee counter, a small kitchen table and space for like sofa seating, etc. So right in uh, front, okay, so this is the section showing the lobby space where you can see that, uh, you know, you have columns and it is open to sky. It is more of a freeing space when uh, you have, when you're working in the faculty block and you need a break, you have a semi-enclosed space right outside. Okay, uh, so the washrooms are right next to the lobby and it is separated as male and female washrooms. Um, an interesting thing about the washroom is that I wanted to provide a space that is open um, to sky where, uh, of course, no one can uh, look in, but it uh, promotes a lot of ventilation where you don't need artificial ventilation to, uh, you know, uh, make the space more breathable. So this is another interesting space, which is called as the discussion room. So basically, this is a room where if students want to have one on one discussion with the faculty. Now, this is where the faculty stay. And suppose there are a few students who are probably lagging behind and they need like special attention. There is a room right next to the faculty room where the teachers can give uh, focused attention to those kids who are probably lagging behind. It can also double like as a detention room for students who don't perform well. They are made to sit here, uh, you know, uh, so th their focused attention uh, maintains because the faculty block is right opposite it. Okay. Uh, so coming to the sections, uh, here I have drawn a section running entirely through the faculty block. Here uh, you can see the activities that are happening where there is a huge window towards the sky. Uh, so I've called it the window to the sky because when you're here, all you can view because of the level it is in, you can just view the sky. Another interesting feature in the faculty block is the pinwheel notice board. So it is a rotatable board where faculties can put up their schedules, their events, notices, etc. So here attached to the faculty block is the discussion room where uh, students can come for extra learning. And this consists of a jolly wall for proper ventilation and a high window that looks out to the garden outside. Uh, here you can see the steps that lead to the lobby space uh, and also the washrooms that are placed right next to it. Uh, 
Uh, there is also a main central skylight that uh, illuminates the faculty block um, completely. Uh, it's an enormous skylight that's placed right above the staircase. Okay, uh, in section BB, you can see the lobby space um, that has a private garden and a jali wall. The lobby space has a sofa seating, uh, like I said before. And uh, in this section, you can also see the mezzanine uh, floor where uh, if there is uh, extra faculties uh, th that, uh, you know, have uh, like ex extra teaching faculties who have come, there's a uh, space available on the up as well. Okay, uh, in section CC, you can see the conversation staircase. So it's a huge uh, semicircular staircase where you can sit out and talk to people as well. And uh, entering into these foldable doors, you come to this water area where uh, there's a staircase leading to the mezzanine floor on the top. So the water area can be filled with, uh, uh, you know, f uh, fish or turtles or etc. Uh, and stuff like that. So this is the water body. This is the staircase leading you to the top. OK, now coming to the common areas. Uh, so this block also consists of the common areas where you have the labs, you have the art room, music rooms that are situated right opposite the faculty block. The idea behind designing these blocks was to immerse the students into activities and give a separate identity for each of the blocks. So in most schools, uh, uh, a lab is technically technically a place which is a room that's in a bigger dimension than the regular classroom and a lab is usually placeless like one night if you take if the labs were interchanged also no one would know so i wanted to design the labs in such a way that when you walk into it you don't need to see the instruments that are kept on the shelf to know what type of a lab it is you can see the architecture to realize that this room is designed for this activity itself like this is you will know that this is a biology room you will know that this is a chemistry room where architecture speaks for itself. I wanted to give the labs an identity instead of considering it something as uh, something so obsolete. Um, so the common areas, they have a discussion ground that consists of a conversation pit with lockers and a huge staircase that takes you up to the art room and the music room. So as you walk into the uh, common block, you will see that there is a wide corridor opening into various labs. Uh, this wide corridor gives you a linear vision into the library block that is placed right next to it. OK, so um, the first room that you see when you walk into the corridor is the biology lab. Uh, once you enter it, you see that there are large windows and a wall that is completely open to the private garden on the outside, where they grow hibiscus and various other plants that can be used for biology experiments and study. So I've designed the biology lab in such a way that um, you will feel like you are among nature because what better way to learn biology than being amidst nature. Uh, so the second lab that you see is the food lab. The food lab is a place for experimentation of recipes and foods that happens to be a vital part of Waldorf curriculum where children learn while doing and it is a hands-on learning all the way. The food lab has an organic garden where students grow their own vegetables and fruits right behind the food lab. Okay, next comes the chemistry lab. Upon entering the chemistry lab, that you will see that there is a wall that is right opposite that consists of a structure that is made entirely to resemble the periodic table. It was also imperative that all the labs I designed had a different view so that years later when you look back at your school days, you will picture the difference in each space and memories won't be clouded of spaces that are similar to each other. So the chemistry lab has a window that lets students peep into the physics lab and acts as a medium of com visual communication. So the last lab on uh, this floor that you see is the physics lab. This opens into a semi-open workshop space, uh, which can be used for large experiments and contraptions that are built by students. So uh, suppose you want to make something uh, that's kind of big, like probably a robot or like a mechanical car, and you can't do it with a, within the confines of this. I've provided an experimental space right outside uh, this area. OK, um, so from the common areas, you reach the uh, OK, wait. Uh, so this is the experimental space. So this is the physics lab that you see happening. And right outside, you have uh, the space for other experimentation tasks to happen. OK, now uh, this shows um, 
the first floor. So basically a huge staircase uh, in the isometric view, you can see that there's this huge staircase that uh, leads to the first floor. It consists of um, an art room and it consists of a music room. Okay, uh, once you enter the first floor, any passerby, the first thing that they see is a, a series of pivot doors. These pivot doors are all the way from the top of the roof to the bottom of the roof. So th these are for students to pin up their artwork as a form of expression. So anyone who walks by will be able to see the works of the students, which makes students, uh, you know, want to draw better, want to uh, present their work better because it's going to be displayed and it's the first thing that anyone will see. Uh, so this also doubles as a door and acts as a canvas for expression. The walls of the art room are made white so that the major highlights are the works of the students. So right next to the art room, you will see that there is a music room. Uh, the music room has a step seating uh, for, for them to sing carols, for telling shlokas, etc. Okay, so these are various sections that are cut through the uh, common areas. Uh, over here, you can see the large staircase, the conversation pit, the staircase that leads to the art room, and you have the food lab right below it. So in this section, you can see the physics lab and the ex experimental space. So this rectangular space that you see is the vision that helps you see the into the library. This is that linear vision into the library. And this is the chemistry lab where uh, you can see the periodic table and uh, you know suspended storage, etc. So here is the biology lab with uh, the green space outside to grow plants for experimentation. And here you have your music room. So this is another view of the staircase, uh, the entry of the staircase. Also rooms have skylights to provide um, beams of light into the room to illuminate the spaces. Okay, uh, so uh, this, this is the library and the cafeteria block. So the library and the cafeteria block are the second biggest structures on the site. The basic idea I had while designing this block was to create a space that was inviting, interesting, and intriguing to all the age groups of students, parents, and the guests alike. The idea was that I wanted this building to be designed in such a way that makes people want to stop and stare at the structure. So at first glance, we notice that the structure is divided into various levels of different heights, having ramps, staircases, slides, sloping roofs, courtyards, skylights, etc. So the first question I asked myself was, what are the various experiences that I want to create in the different zones of the structure? Okay, so the ground floor of the structure consists of majority of the public functions. The ground floor is divided into two zones, uh, one on the left and one on the right. So the left zone has the museum, the gift shop, gallery, and the ramp. And the right zone has uh, the cafeteria, the toilets, the seating, and a spiral staircase. So uh, going into the entry of the block. So the entry is through a series of staircase that leads you to the cafeteria block. So you can see the cafeteria seating. Uh, uh, you will see a, a wall with uh, the specials of the day, whatever the food for the day is. And right behind it, you have your hand wash area. Um, here you have the serving area where uh, they can take the food, come and sit uh, over here while they finish the food. And right here, uh, you have your hand wash. And, uh, mm. you Okay. Um, so this is the cafeteria seating. This is the serving area. These are the toilets. And uh, okay. So amidst the seating area is a spiral staircase that leads to the first floor. Uh, once you finish eating, you can go up to the library and read and relax before getting back into the class. So this is a spiral staircase that takes you to the library. Uh, the seating of the library consists of huge inbuilt steps where students can sit together and read. So if you can see the green color structures where these are inbuilt uh, seating areas for the children. Okay, now this is a, a on the other side. Uh, you can see that there is a ramp that leads to this mezzanine floor. Okay, um, when you enter uh, into the left zone, uh, this ramp kind of invites you to climb up to the mezzanine floor, which further lets you reach to the summit of the structure. So my main goal was basically to create experiences for a child to discover, a place that has scope for the imagination. 
uh, on the left, there is a gallery to display art of probably the weavers or the students itself. And right behind it is the gift shop designed for guests and tourists who are interested to buy the works of the weavers. So this ramp takes you up to uh, the mezzanine floor. The journey from the bottom of the ramp to the top allows you to see a courtyard that is open to sky right below it. Um, and then you reach the mezzanine floor library. The mezzanine floor library is the smaller of the two libraries. The main interesting feature of this block is the slide. So uh, this slide that you see connects the major library to the smaller library. Um, so my basic idea was to create a structure that was open so that it doesn't feel like you're so that it feels like you're a part of the surroundings and part of nature. Hence, there are bamboo co columns that are supporting the roof structure and there are no walls blocking the vision of the surroundings around. As this was the library block, my concept was derived from one of my favorite books when I was a kid, which was uh, Alice in Wonderland, where. Um, OK. So this is uh, where she falls down the rabbit hole and she encounters different creatures, different places, and it seems like different worlds. Hence, the slide, the ramp, and the staircase are technically like architectural metaphors, where the rabbit, uh, which, uh, which technically depicts the rabbit hole, where uh, she falls into different zones and levels, having different activities, providing various different ex uh, experiences to the child. Uh, and the form of the library and cafeteria is designed in such a way that a person who has never visited the space might be confused, but also curious as to how to reach the various spaces. Just like how Alice keeps getting lost, but she keeps uh, getting lost is how she discovers new things and new people and new places. OK, uh, so the final block is the weaver's hub. Uh, so Anegundi's uh, main occupation include agriculture and weaving. The weaving uh, occupation is done uh, entirely with women. So um, most of the women uh, teach their children at a young age to learn to weave because, uh, to weave because it uh, is a stable form of income. Uh, so the Weaver, Weaver's Hub is designed primarily for the women weavers of Ani Gundi, but I've tried to provide a platform for creative growth, learning, and teaching. The basic idea for the Weaver's Block on campus was to design a space amidst nature, but in isolation from the rest of the school. This creates a type of ecosystem within itself where the major interaction between the women happen within the limits of this block. And this provides a more open workspace which engages them with nature and moves the away from the typical work environment and creates a more informal setting. So the weaver's block is situated in the middle of a coconut plantation. So on all four sides and it, like above your head, all you see are coconut trees and leaves, which helps you work in solitude. So this induces uh, better creativity within the weavers. So the planning um, basically consists of a single module that is multiplied four times. Uh, so uh, multiplying these modules four times kind of created a courtyard with two intersecting axes. And on either sides of these axes consists of the four workspaces. This promotes a more engaging work environment where majority of the circulation happens at the center. So uh, from getting to here to here, you will be engaging with the people around you. So this creates a livelier ecosystem. Uh, each module consists of um, five spaces. Uh, so you have the workspace, you have the display areas, you have the storage areas, and you have the toilets. And the most important feature of the Weaver's Hub are these uh, staircase that you see right in front of the workspaces. So uh, here I try to follow the principle of elements doing things that they shouldn't be doing. For example, the steps, instead of being only ways to reach various levels, these steps also act as a semi uh, enclosed um, element promoting maximum interaction between the people, making it as engaging as possible. So upon entering the main axis, uh, we see that there is a huge wall with a water body below it. The wall is designed as a feature wall. Uh, so 
as you walk into the weavers block the first view that you see is this wall uh, with these different colored tiles and you see that there's a staircase that is disappearing into an other structure itself so uh, the reason that this wall was designed this way because i wanted it to resemble something looking like a tapestry because weaving is nothing but uh, you, you know something like crochet something that's extremely creative and i wanted it to be an abstract of something woven it looks like a woven material <clears throat> okay so the uh, the weaver's block is made you uh, mainly using rammed earth and the contrast color i have uh, used is a pink concrete uh, which kind of depicts that it's empowered by women because all the workers here are only going to be women so uh, it was a sort of bringing identity to the place through the color uh, so these consist of sloping roofs and the walls are made uh, porous in such a way that there is enough ventilation and it, it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, confine you within the four walls of um, the space. So all these spaces that you see, um, uh, most of uh, most of the, these spaces towards this green space, they will have huge trees, which uh, kind of makes you feel like you are a part of nature, although you are indoors. Um, so, you know, working like a nine to five job, it is important that, uh, you know, they have good views, good interaction that doesn't make them feel like it's a burden or it's some sort of trouble. So I've tried to create interesting spaces like there's a swing at one point at one part where they can take the where they can take the, um, you know, their weaving and sit on the swings while they do it. And, uh, you know, you have a display area for them to uh, display their work for people to come and see and learn uh, the culture and traditions and uh, the the practices that Anigundi is known for. So I wanted to create a sort of a platform where, uh, you know, uh, it, you're, you're developing the community through the school. You're just not helping the student pass his 10th grade. You're trying to create memories. You're trying to uh, enrich the life of Anigundi through the school. So uh, thank you. Um. Yeah, this is Sharon here. Yeah. I had a doubt for you. Yes. How do you define those uh, playgrounds of uh, kindergarten and the age group of one to four, uh, uh, the primary block? I wanted to. Okay, uh, so one thing you have to understand while uh, designing for children is you need to forget everything you know about children. There are certain philosophers who have done depth detailed study of what helps a child grow and there are many philosophers uh, you can choose Aurobindo for example I have chosen Rudolf Steiner and he says that ages of uh, 6 to 12 require this type of growth uh, like when I said uh, when I designed the uh, uh, what is that um, the pet the zoo uh, the petting zoo for the children it's because at that age is when the students learn how to again compassion towards animals towards things that are alive so uh, there will be principles and uh, rules that are already predefined by uh, certain philosophists so you need to find what works best for you what works best for your place thank you that was really helpful sure no problem I have a question. Or uh, inside your opinion, actually, on this. Okay. Uh, when we start talking about your site studies, how you manage to do your site studies, and you spend time there, especially yes. in the morning, afternoon, and evening, you know, the same site. And so, what would any can you give me any suggestions or you know because now that we are having through the pandemic and obviously it's site studies are very difficult to go. You know, that kind of, but any thought, any thought of obviously we can't replace what you have that is going there is what we get is something. But any any thought just uh, on how can we do a little better job than what we can do? Any thoughts that you have on this problem that we're facing right now? Uh, okay, so yeah, it's extremely unfortunate that you know we can't, uh, you guys can't visit the site and uh, you can't design for the site right now. But let me tell you, it is not impossible. It's completely possible to gather your data. Like I feel right now, uh, so. Uh, 
any any project right now like i'm working on a project as well and i i can't visit the site at all everything i have to do is through word of mouth through finding contacts of people like if you're really passionate about knowing the site i'm sure there'll be ways you can find it like depending on your site you will find people who know about the space you can send out surveys you can uh, whatsapp surveys to people so they explain the site to you you can probably pay them to give you your surveys you can ask them uh, you know uh, you can ask them any questions that you want to and um, i would suggest don't limit yourself to just like looking at a google earth picture and uh, assuming that yeah this is where you have these trees uh, this is where you have these hills etc don't don't do that like find out what the benefits of having those things are like speak to people um, you know ask them like uh, you know what what do these uh, uh, like if the hills act as a potential if these trees act as a potential so um, i would suggest that uh, you know there are ways that you can um, Uh, go ahead with it i really suggest surveys because i gave out like 100 surveys to almost everyone i didn't give it to just children because uh, i wanted to know the point of view of the parents as well of the elders in the uh, school so i think surveys is the best way to go because you're talking directly to the people who have lived there all their lives right so that's probably something that might uh, help you a lot thank you yeah thank you yes Hello, I am Pooja. How do Hi, Pooja. How do I get to know the problem statement? How do you get to know the what? Problem statement. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, I, I I can't really hear you. I think your voice is breaking. Problem statement. Okay, so what do you want to know exactly about the problem statement? Like, how do we uh, how do we analyze the problems over the um, project we are working? Okay. Uh, so okay, technically, you know that. Um, no place is perfect right like there's no ideally designed place for everything so every place has its own benefits every place has its own drawbacks and uh, what you're supposed to do is uh, you're supposed to make a list you you make a list of all the negative things of the place you make a list of all the positive things of the place now you need to find out what the negative things of the place are right so uh, I, i know it's like extremely difficult because you can't visit the site um like i said previously i think right now the only way to do it is through surveys is through research is through a lot of research uh, if you can go to the site you will get to know so many potentials and so many problems of the site that you can create a map of all the problems and a map of all the potentials of the site so i would suggest that if you can go you will realize the uh, extent of problems and extent of potentials and it just doesn't come naturally you have to talk to people you have to sit in the site for hours you have to sit and observe everything you have to sit and watch the sun set you have to sit and watch the sun rise and that's what's going to uh, you know give you ideas for the design so you won't be designing in air you you will Uh, so i really suggest that you know you find ways to go to the site because it's extremely crucial uh, for any design that you kind of connect to it uh, thank you thank you so much yeah and you have to be very critical to stuff as well you need to observe and analyze everything you, you just can't see like a pit on the ground and be like yeah it's just a pit on the ground you have to understand if that's going to be a potential or if that's going to be a problem or how you can make that problem into a possible uh, potential so uh, the way you find uh, all you know like how you ask me how you find problems is just by thing in depth I understood that. Uh, 
Uh, so do any of you have any more questions for me? I think we leave it at that then. Uh, uh, okay. So, thank yeah, you. Very much. If you want to add some last point, you can tell to. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I just really hope that at least it inspired you a bit to help you start your design process. And uh, you can always contact me and ask me any sort of doubts. I'd I'd love to help uh, any of you. So, yeah. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you very much, dear, for your time. Uh, I, I, I mean, definitely it's going to be uh, it's definitely inspirational for them. I just hope. And we make sure you would like to add something, please. Yes, dear. I think this was very interesting. Uh, you know, you took us through the entire design process. You explain everything in good detail. You know, this also tells uh, students you know to what uh, depth we should uh, you know detail our spaces, you know, design our spaces. Uh, you know, this being their first uh, design uh, exercise, I think uh, uh, they will, you know, they, they have learned a lot uh, from your, your presentation. And uh, you know, so thank you, thank you for presenting this. This was wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ria. It was wonderful to have you over here and actually share your experience with them. Um, yeah, uh, actually done thesis and well presented. Thank you so much, ma'am. So we hope that we'll have some more uh, collaborations like this happening in future also. Do let us know if anything interesting is happening with your profession right now, career. If you can help us in any way, our platform is always open. So we'll see if something more like this can happen in future also with some of the batches. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care.